Welcome to what we think is the first Oxford um, Digital Ethnography Group seminar in person for the last three and a half years. Um, and very weird and spooky it is to see wet humans. Um, and I hope people online can hear. Um, so before um, I introduce the speaker, I should point out that in two weeks time, we have another speaker in person, and that will be in 61 Banbury Road in the anthropology department. And it's uh, Dr. Kate Siek, who is an applied anthropologist working for Toyota. So if you want to um, learn about how anthropologists work in business, please come along in two weeks time. Um, so tonight, today, this afternoon, I mean, um, I'm very pleased to um, introduce John Postal, making his second appearance at a digital ethnography seminar because he was in year two of our um, now reasonably long running seminar. He's an anthropologist of politics, of alternative politics, and has worked in Spain, Indonesia, Malaysia, Malaysia um, and has just is popping in to see us on his way back from Peru. Um, and I will hand over to John. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, it's great. It's great to be to be back, uh, and that we've overcome the technical issues. Um, yes, that's the. Uh, I'm going to aim for forty minutes, uh, and that's the title there. Whatever works, digital ethnography as a flat methodology. I'll explain the uh, the joke later with that term, flat methodology. Okay. How do you move this slide? Seems to be moving. Any idea how to operate the slides? Um, no. <laughs> the arrows don't seem to be responding. Okay, so let's try clicking on that and then. Uh, yeah. okay. Right. Thanks. Okay. So uh, many of you will have seen the abstract. Uh, I draw from 20 years practicing digital ethnography in the UK, Malaysia, Indonesia, Spain. And I say Australia, but that most recent project uh, happened physically in Melbourne, but it was about the Anglosphere. It was an online study, mostly the US and the UK, uh, remotely and online during COVID. And what I do is that I try to appraise this methodology looking at uh, social movement research, uh, my own research on social movements as the focus. So I'll start by giving a brief overview of digital ethnography as a fuzzy, free-spirited form of qualitative research. By the way, this is all my own take on it, okay? <laughs> I'm, I will be suggesting that this luckily is a very idiosyncratic approach and that there's still in this day and age the possibility to do things in quite, an, uh, quite a creative way as long as you don't feel too constrained by uh, the anxieties that go with any methodological approach. So then I'll compare two projects, the hybrid, i.e. online offline study of Spain's 15M or Indignados movement in the early 2010s, which then became a similar study in Indonesia. And then uh, a more re uh, a recently completed lurking study of the so-called anti-woke movement. I'm using the term woke, by the way, in a, in a, in a neutral way. And uh, what I will be arguing is for this idea of digital photography as a flat methodology that need not elevate any one method, not even participant observation. That comes from my own anthropological background where we are trained to put participant observation at the heart of what we do. And I'm suggesting, yes, participant observation is, is great, but we don't always have to do it. And it's not always possible to go to the field as we saw during COVID and in other, in other cases. 
So this agnosticism gives researchers, I argue, a license to do whatever works as long as they can overcome those epistemological and institutional anxieties that go with this seemingly anarchic way of doing things. It's quite difficult to explain sometimes to ethics committees and to colleagues and, of course, to political scientists that uh, we make it up as we go along. A lot of time, a lot of time we don't really know what we're doing, uh, but that's the way we like it. Uh, now, let me start with a short tale of entry. Some years ago, I was, well, quite a few years ago, 2009, I had um, a bit of a dead end job in, uh, in a, a, at a university in the north of England. And uh, a friend in London sent me a, an ad from The Economist saying that uh, the ad had my name on it. Uh, not literally, but it, it was, it, it was a, the perfect fit. They were looking for someone in Barcelona who could do a study of internet activism, who spoke Spanish and possibly some Catalan as well, and who would ask whether the new social media back then, 2009, 2010, whether they're making any significant difference to the work of activists locally in Barcelona. This is Manuel Castell's Internet uh, Center uh, Institute in Barcelona. So I, uh, I put the kids in front of the Teletubbies, as you did back then, uh, before we knew it was bad. We just thought that we could leave them in front of the telly. And I rushed off an application, and I, I ended up for one year in Barcelona. So that's a center that some of you will be fami very familiar with, the Internet Institute, uh, which is part of the Open University in Catalonia. So that's the outline. What is, I'll start by very briefly uh, giving you my take on digital ethnography, but I can't really pretend to represent all ethnographers, all digital ethnographers. Then I'll talk about digital ethnography as it has been increasingly applied to the study of social movements uh, and activism, uh, after which I'll talk about the two, I'll compare the two projects that I've done in recent years, one of them through online, both online and offline participation and the more recent work on online lurking, ending with uh, a flat methodology. So these are just some of the places where there's quite a lot of digital ethnography research going on. It's been booming, I think, over the past 10 years or so. We may not agree what we mean by digital ethnography, and, and many people don't bother trying to define it, but as an idea, as an approach, it has been growing. These are some of the texts, uh, not comprehensive, that I've been personally connected to, that I'm familiar with, but there's, there's a lot more out there. Uh, this one on the left came out I think 2015 and then uh there are you know publications within this space of digital anthropology slash ethnography there's even now a critical strand of work so as a sign that the field is coming of age or growing up now we have inside criticism where we're beginning to critique the method from within, this is an example from Gabriele de Setta, Three Lies of Digital Ethnography. And that's a textbook I mentioned earlier, which came out in 2015, Digital Ethnography Principles and Practice, which we put together, uh, all of us working, uh, well, at one point, we're all at RMIT University in Melbourne, which is my current employer. Uh, you may remember that we made the point that there are five principles of digital ethnography. Multiplicity is the first one. There's no single way to engage with the digital. Digital decentering, you should never uh, give private place to the digital. Uh, although here, I would say, well, sometimes you, I'm, I'm sort of critiquing our own work <laughs> with hindsight. Uh, sometimes it's fine, I think, to, to put the digital first, if that's what's actually happening. You know, there are moments in social life and in political moments where the digital takes center stage. So I wouldn't say, I would say at this, um, at this point, I would say neither centering nor decentering. It, it depends on the actual thing that you're looking at. Openness, research is a series of open events. 
reflexivity uh, researchers should or can engage in reflexive practice. And finally, unorthodoxy, you are attentive to alternative ways of communicating. I've recently come up with my own response to that because I found it a bit vague, that uh, attempt we made in 2015. I'm not sure how successful I'll be with this, but what I'm now suggesting that you can also say the following. I'm saying you could also uh, describe it as an open-ended, immersive, an inductive, versatile and reflexive approach to the study of digital phenomena that typically entails online and or offline. This is an important point to make, I think, that um, it can be almost fully online, like the, thing, the stuff that I've done recently for the past few years. It can be almost entirely offline uh, with, of course, digital devices being used in, in most situations um, with participant observation normally at the heart of things, uh, as well as typically semi-structured interviews, archival work and other research methods. So this is uh, another connection to this <laughs> field. There's also the field, the subfield of media anthropology. Some of you will be familiar with the e-seminars. In fact, there is an e-seminar coming up on the 10th of November. It's an old fashioned mailing list. Uh, via email, we do these two week seminars. And again, there's an overlap here. Um, it, I think it's more interesting to look at what different strands of researchers are doing as opposed to spending too long trying to agonize over what we're doing is it can be called digital ethnography or not. And that's an example of an early work in, in media anthropology, a, a classic textbook by now that came out in 2002. It's a reader of research that was done in the 1990s mostly, still a very useful reference a good book to have handy, because a lot of the current affairs that we're dealing with are, of course, recurrent affairs. And this came out, uh, oh, you can save 860. I didn't realize that. Uh, mm. This came out last year or earlier this year. And this is the one, by the way, we'll be discussing on the 10th. Now, my own trajectory, very briefly, I started off doing media anthropology through long-term fieldwork in East Malaysia, in Sarawak, among the Iban and indigenous group in, in Malaysia. And that was radio and television. That research was 95 to 97. That was 18 months of fieldwork, which nowadays is not that easy to, to have all that time. Uh, and that was radio and TV. To what extent radio and TV uh, contributed to the building of um, a not not a national identity? I was more interested in in the idea of a national culture in a country as new as Malaysia, that as you may know was created in 1963, and then Singapore pulled out in 65. It's a very recent uh, arrangement. Then I moved with my colleague, uh, Birgit Breuschler. We moved to the, this question of theorizing media and practice as an edited volume. And after that, in 2011, I, I shifted towards the study of the internet. So like many others, I think many uh, academics of my generation, we who work within media and communication, we started with the older media and many of us ended up looking at the the newer media, but carrying that legacy of having studied the older media. Uh, that's the textbook I mentioned earlier, Digital Ethnography 2015. In 2018, uh, and I think that's what I talked about last time I was here, mm -hmm. the early, my early work on uh, nerd politics. Uh, and now the one that's coming out um, next year in March, uh, it's a study of the so-called anti-woke movement uh, that where I'm trying to look at things in a very suspiciously sounding positivistic way. I'm just asking about cause and effect. I'm, I'm asking about what effects digital practices have in the making of a new mediated world. I'm asking whether it's possible to study causality uh, as an ethnographer. And the answer is, 
I'm not sure yet. Uh, I think it might be too late to, it will be too late to rewrite the book, but it is a very challenging thing to try and demonstrate, of course, that podcasting or YouTubing have tangible effects that you can actually study. Um, most of you will be familiar. I'm sure this is a, a joke that you've seen in this uh, room or online many times. This suspicion that uh, anthropologists who do online stuff are not really doing serious work. Um, my field work lacks anything approaching a coherent methodology. Ethnography is like jazz. I quite like that one. <laughs> Actually, I, I find this made quite, I don't see it. Uh, I don't know why they're making fun of us. Um, so this idea that digital ethnography is just killing time online. There is something to be said to, about that. You do end up killing a lot of time and it you don't separate it from other things that you do online. It's especially during COVID, um, most of us were stuck at home, especially, well, Melbourne was, was uh, the best example where we had um, a, a very long lockdown. And while you're doing other stuff online, the for a topic like mine, the online culture wars, it was impossible to separate your personal consumption of content from the culture wars. So very briefly, uh, what do we know about digital ethnography and social movements? Well, we have um, quite a number of studies by now. The This exploratory, big data, skeptical spirit of digital ethnography it's nicely captured an article by Wang and Liu that came out in 21 on the social media practices of Chinese feminists and lawyers. They, these authors suggest that, I quote, qualitative methods such as participant observation, in-depth interviews and textual analysis can provide thick descriptions of, uh, and deep localized knowledge of social processes that go far beyond the sketches of big data. I remember a, a moment a few years ago when there was a bit of a moral panic within the small field of digital anthropology, digital ethnography, where a lot of us felt, oh, maybe I should finally start learning some, some of that technology stuff. I should start learning more of the quantitative big data thing. Uh, I think, David, actually, you, you were a pioneer and you did a lot of that. But some of us, I suppose, resisted. And we said, well, I'll just do what I've always done. Uh, that resistance to change can have its benefits because then you end up with a more diverse field. If all of us had decided, you know, let's do mixed methodology, let's integrate algorithms in AI and, and everything else. But I'm happy to discuss this. I, I think this might come up in the discussion. To what extent do we have to learn AI and, and all that stuff? I never learned any of that. Uh, I do feel a bit um, uh, embarrassed to confess that as I, I'll mention in a moment, I still use the same old fashioned methods of sometimes pen and paper, uh, these Microsoft folders with Word documents. I've never used um, this is uh, maybe I've never confessed this publicly. Uh, I've never used any of those ethnographic sof software packages, but I'm not suggesting you shouldn't. I'm just saying that mm, it works for me. So far, I've managed to be able to do quite a lot. Uh, and I'll explain in a moment how does work and how that works. So in the social movements field, uh, when I was in Barcelona, this idea by Manuel Castells of the network society and the, the importance of studying networks was very important. And we had quite a number of activist researchers who were combining the internet research with the idea of the network society and they were doing social network analysis. That was critiqued by some of us. Uh, I was always a bit dubious of the idea that we now have to concentrate on uh, looking at networks. There's critical work by the anthropologist Veronica Barassi. Uh, others have critiqued this idea of the network society or to of, of trying to quantify perhaps excessively through social network analysis. There's also, if you remember, early 2010s, the, this rise of, uh, in the study of hashtag ethnographies. We had quite a number of hashtag ethnographies 
people like Moylerman and, and Bouchel and the people looking at the Occupy movement, Bonilla and Rosa, a number of other colleagues have been working on uh, hashtag ethnographies. Many of us have been discussing the hybrid nature of this kind of research in different ways, uh, how the off online and the offline is articulated or not, uh, digital versus non-digital practices. So hybridity has been one of those words that keep coming back. Uh, Emiliano Trere, for example, the social movement scholar, has, has a book where he talks about a number of different forms of hybridity. And of course, practices. No one has, has ever had a bad word to say about practices. Everyone loves the word practices. We had a book on media practices. Uh, one or two people have said bad things about practices, but virtually all of us ethnographers, we love the idea of looking at media practices, digital practices. Uh, and I think what I found writing this recent book is that you can end up being a little bit too practice centric. It's, if everything is about practices, sometimes you end up forgetting norms, actions, um, artifacts, things that are not practices. I prefer to approach it with a, with a rather um, eclectic or agnostic view of, of ontology of, of the, the social things out there. I prefer not to decide beforehand whether practices will turn out to be more important than norms or whether institutions will be more important. Uh, so as you can imagine, this open-endedness can be quite uh, frustrating at times when you don't really know what to focus on. What's the solution to that? You follow, uh, you decide who you're following, you decide who you're studying. You decide, well, I'm not gonna do all types of nerds, I'm just gonna do techno-political nerds, which is what I did in the end. I decided to focus on digital rights activists in Barcelona and Indonesia. So to me, ethnography, but again, this is my own personal take, is, is more often than not ends up being about deciding what group of people or what category, but normally what group network of people you are studying without falling for the allure of uh, network society ideas and so on. So let's move very quickly to the first example, my study of uh, Spain's Indignados movement in Barcelona. This was 2010, 2011, but I followed up uh, online and remotely over the years. Uh, it, took, it took quite a few years to get the, the study done. Back then in 2010, when I landed in Spain, there was a very strong uh, economic recession. This was soon after the global financial crisis and the housing crisis in, in many in some countries that affected the Spanish economy really badly, very high unemployment, especially young people, young people in some places, 50%, 60% unemployment. And uh, no one expected the Spanish Revolution. Uh, it, it came as a surprise that Spanish people would come out and emulate their counterparts in the Arab world. If, if, if you remember, the Arab Spring was in uh, late December, early 20, uh, late December 2010 and early 2011. And when I was doing my research there, the digital rights activists uh, we're looking at what was happening in Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be part of the discussions where they came up with the idea of this um, digital, uh, sorry, uh, real democracy now. Some of the slogans were discussed in, in techno-political circles, and then they went, they went mainstream, both online and offline. These were some of the activists I was working on, uh, working on, I was working with in Barcelona, in, in, during that time, 2010, 2011, from a, a group that specialized in internet rights, copyright, that sort of study. And if you read the article I wrote with Sarah Pink back in 2012, we talked about the everyday practices of a digital ethnographer based on my experience. Uh, back then it was laptop and a very basic mobile. I <laughs> I resisted at the time having uh, one of the early smartphones. Uh, so it was 
there were these five main sub practices catching up by going online on my laptop and seeing what was happening with the activists, politicians, journalists I was following, mostly via Twitter, but also through other channels, Facebook as well back then. Sharing is when you look at content that you find interesting and you share with other people, you share with your research participants. And it's, it's a very low cost way of keeping in touch with people. Exploring is when you go uh, further, someone sends you content or you see something online and you do a small uh, exploration normally not going off, not wandering off too far from the focus of your research. Interacting could happen because if it's a hybrid study, it could happen online and or, or offline. Uh, there was quite a bit of remote ethnography as well, because sometimes I had to come back to the UK. And I remember once I, I missed out on a really important event that my actors were organizing in Barcelona. And it was quite uh, frustrating at first, but then I realized a lot of people, like today we have here, now that we've sorted the technology, a lot of you are actually following the event remotely. Uh, so remote is not the same as uh, virtually. Virtual is one thing, remotely is another, if there is a physical event going on. And archiving is quite a neglected sub-practice but it's incredibly important. We work a lot with social media archives. We work a lot with um, posts that were left there online. And uh, yeah, there is lots of information, but depending on the field you're looking at, there's generally more than enough redundancy of content for you to gain an idea of what, what happened during that event. So that was one example of one attempt at mapping the social media lands landscape back then in 2011, this, I think a French uh, author put Facebook and Google in the middle, but in the case of the Indignados I was working with, it was Twitter that was really at the heart of what Chadwick calls a hybrid media system. And it's the same to this day. Uh, the anti-wokes I've been researching, the culture warriors I've been looking at, mostly in the US and the UK. Uh, Twitter is incredibly central X today. It's still that hub where journalists, activists, academics, others, uh, they, they go there to keep up with what's happening and share content. So this is an example of the offline research where it's offline, but it's also hybrid. A lot of people are there connecting, this is a meeting of the free culture activists. And that led to the occupation of squares in 2011, after which the movement devolved into the neighborhoods. When they left the squares, they, they went, one of the places they went in, in, in addition to the, to the internet was local neighborhoods. Right, so that was my hybrid study in the past. What I didn't really anticipate was that I'd be doing that my next research project, long-term research project would be almost entirely online. I, I spent, I don't even know how long I spent. I, I'm not entirely sure when I started this project because it was an undeclared project, something that emerged organically from following some of these characters online, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris, Joe Rogan, uh, people like that. Uh, I had, uh, many years ago, I'd been looking at the new atheist movement, like many men my age, for some reason, uh, somehow we, we, not for the any theological insights, there was very little new you could learn from the new atheist movement, but I found it quite entertaining at the time. Uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Chris Hitchens, people like that were quite entertaining. And that new atheist movement became one of the things that it that, that it became, or, or rather one of the strands of what today we call the intellectual dark web, the, the anti-woke movement comes from new atheists, who I suppose ran out of ideas. They, how long can you, how many years can you bang on about the 
most probable fact that there is no God is seems highly likely, I think, that there is no God. But how long can you keep doing that? So that evolved in the 2010s into the anti-woke uh, movement, uh, 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 an opposition to uh, social justice activism. This is the intellectual dark web. You probably reckon you might recognize some of them. That's Eric Weinstein there on, on the left, uh, Heather Hying, Joe Rogan, Dave Rubin, uh, Christina Hoff Summers, Sam Harris, and here, um, uh, the other Weinstein, Brett Weinstein. This name, the intellectual dark web, was a moniker given to, well, it was Eric actually there on the left who came up with the with this label, and then it took off via the New York Times. Barry Wise in the New York Times in 2018 started down, um, wrote a, a, an essay that uh, gained quite a lot of traction back then. Now, I call it a flat methodology, partly because it happened out of my flat in, in Melbourne. Mm. It's not exactly a flat, but the joke wouldn't work. Uh, it, it was during COVID that I really started working on this project that I realized this could turn into something. And there was no funding, self-funded. And I also call it uh, whatever works. I call it a flat methodology because, as I said earlier, I don't want to elevate participant observation. I suppose in a way it's a way of justifying that I stayed at home instead of doing the hard work of going off to the field. But um, I want to suggest that it's not the end of the world. There is a lot you can do if you're stuck at home. Uh, and I seriously don't think my more recent work is any worse than the stuff that I did when I went offline. I don't think they are, I think they're comparable. I, I don't think... To me, it's about the materials that you collect. To me, it's about becoming not so much a content creator as a content collector. You collect stuff left, right, and center, almost obsessively. You build up piles of materials, tweets, news media articles, uh, podcasts, anything you can get hold of. You pile it out, you put it in folders, and that is, that's it. We could stop the talk there. That's really what it boils down to, collecting stuff. And I think, I suppose, I'm just thinking aloud here that there's all this mystique about methodology. We, we worry too much about methodology. We have to regain some simplicity about it. And, and, and when, you, when you go out in, in real life, you don't go out with a methodology. I'm going down to the pub. What, what's my methodology? Well, some, I, I do think about methodology. But normal people like, don't go out there in social life with a methodology and ethnography should be very natural should be very close to what we do anyway if you want to if you're a fan god forbid of say jordan peterson um, the things that you do as a fan of jordan peterson are the same things that an ethnographer would be who wants to study jordan peterson even if he or she hates the man it's very similar things you listen to the youtube clips you look at how some people make fun of him and others adore him. Uh, the only difference is that you collect everything obsessively. So you gather materials left, right and center across platforms, transmedia. I've never I've never been interested in staying in a on a single platform. It's always possible to delimit your study and say, well, I can't study everything. I'm just going to do YouTube. I'm just going to do a few channels. That's entirely possible. My own approach has always been I'll follow these people because I choose the people. I don't choose, I don't study platforms. I study people. So if these people all happen to be on YouTube all the time, that's great. I'll, I'll, I'll go wherever they go. But if it goes somewhere else, I feel it's more interesting. And to understand them, I, I, I feel like I need to go to those other places as well. So I never decide beforehand uh, that I'll be working on a single platform. Then... Um, so it's across platforms and it's also transmedia. Again, this idea of the hybrid media system. Uh, a lot of these people are on, on TV, on, on the radio. They, they put stuff out through the Daily Telegraph, the Sun, the Daily Mail, uh, New York Post. Uh, they go on Fox News. They're doing, many of them, the, the more prominent public figures, they're doing the old media as well in a digital era. Then you triangulate, but 
again, I don't set out to triangulate. I don't set out to do anything. I just get on with it. And But when you write up your findings, then it's much better if you're able to triangulate. You don't want to depend on a single post that someone put out there. You try and triangulate. So that's where the, the idea of building up piles of stuff comes, comes into it. Follow the people. If it matters to them, it matters to me. Of course, that's the old anthropological maxim. What are these people obsessed with? What are they interested in? What are the things that matter to them? In this case, the anti-woke uh, people are, of course, obsessed with the fate of the Western world. They want to defend the West from its enemies, enemies within as well as enemies without, but especially what they regard as the enemies within. You write your, oh, this is an important one, I think. You write up the materials you have, not those you wish you have. This is something that I've encountered with PhD students many times, that, and it's happened to me as well, uh, that you want to answer a question. I've got to answer my question. Unless I go and do that. I said I would do this. How can I not go out there and interview 40 people? I won't, I won't be able to answer my question. The solution, maybe it's not a solution, maybe you'll excommunicate me for saying that I don't often ask questions. I don't usually have a research question. I know this may sound very, I'm glad one of you is nodding. Uh, I don't really, I honestly don't know what the question is. And I've got to a point where I don't care what the question is. I do realize that within an institutional setting, if you're doing a PhD or a postdoc and you're being funded, uh, then you have you're expected to have that framework and so on. But the advantage of not having a question is that all you have to do is follow the people. What sort of questions are they asking? What sorts of cognition in the wild is going on? What sort of uh, thinking are they doing out loud? Because all my stuff is public, is open source. I don't do any hacking. I don't do leaking. None of that. I just get stuff that is publicly available, and that people have put out, uh, out there of their own volition, as far as, as one can tell. And then the most effective method, uh, of course, having a deadline. There's nothing like, uh, I, I, I hate deadlines uh, like most, most people, but they are really very useful because that, that's when you realize it's not really about methodology, it's really about collecting enough, enough stuff so you can hand in the thing that you said you would hand in. It's enough. It's a work in progress. It just, uh, and if you haven't got enough, then that's that's a problem. If you haven't got, if you haven't collected enough stuff. By the way, by flat, I also mean primary and secondary. Uh, I don't, I don't privilege my own primary research. I I get whatever I can. If I've done lots of primary research on the topic, that's fine. For example, in, uh, in the nerd politics book, I had my own research on Barcelona and my own research in Jakarta with an Indonesian colleague. But then I, I added two other case studies in the same chapter, the same topic, digital rights in Spain, Indonesia, Brazil, and the US. And I chose Brazil and the US because I had, there was a PhD thesis that someone did on Brazil, and there was a really nice journal article someone did on the US. So you collect, you, you line up all your ducks, and you use other people's citing it, of course. I'm not saying I'm going around plagiarizing, not, not that. What I mean is you cite them, but as I'm sure many of you have experience, once you know a topic really well, because you've done your own primary research, it becomes easier to read secondary research on the same sort of phenomenon and to integrate it into your own account. So, um, the commercial break. This is the book, uh, The Anthropology Digital Practice, uh, that's coming out in March. It links digital ethnography, coarse ethnography, and media practice to track the effects of new media practices in a digital world. Although there, I should have said, in a hybrid media world. It invites media and communication students and scholars to overcome their fields of aversion to media effects, especially media studies, is more effects of earth and explore the messy, complex, open-ended effects of new media practices in a digital age. Uh, I won't go through the entire book. Uh, don't worry, I'll just give you a very brief 
uh, not summary, I'll just mention some of the things that are in there. Uh, I've just recently written the postscript, which I finished uh, yesterday, on how the anti wokes are reacting to what's happening in, in Israel and Palestine. Uh, in some cases, quite predictably, but in others, they're reacting in, in unanticipated things that in ways that I, I wouldn't have anticipated. So what I'm doing is that I in, start by discussing so-called woke politics or social justice activism, then uh, an introduction to the anti-woke, some of the people I mentioned earlier. Of course, that uh, chapter four is a play on Apadurai's social life of things. How can we study uh, social things, especially media things, media practices, media norms, and so on? Uh, how can we study the, the really messy, complex causality uh, the answer is you try and identify the more significant media things that um, that seem to be shaping a political process. To give you a quick example, there was a there was a conflict on a U.S. campus on Evergreen State College in 2017 involving Brett Weinstein, uh, the guy who was here, who is who is a Bernie Sa Bernie Sanders voter, an Occupy movement guy, who got into trouble because he decided not to uh, agree to be absent from campus on a day reserved for, for people of color. There was a, a new uh, tradition was initiated that year in 2017 where white people were asked not to be on campus that day. And he, he disagreed with that. He became famous slash infamous. And it all started with an email. It all started, well, a series of emails, university emails, uh, and we know this from organizations, some of the scandals that the leaks that happen out of organizations often happen with email. So I didn't go out there to study email. Well, I didn't stay at home to study email, but it, it was the it was via this email discussion and the email that that guy, that academic sent that was blasphemous to the other camp that things really kicked off. Then there was social media. Uh, the guy went on TV. He went on uh, on Fox News to talk to Tucker Carlson. Uh, it escalated from there. So what I do in that chapter, the chapter on Trump, Trump and text, is that I, I studied that social drama, the Manchester School, Victor Turner, social drama, stage by stage. And the initial stage of that social or media drama is is triggered by that email. It all started with an email. So there's a discussion about texts and intertextuality and what happens if we, if we call everything content, we're missing out on other things. I, I look at the work of, um, of Catherine Barber, who talks about orality and textuality in Nigeria and other places, the theory of, of linguistic texts as opposed to visual texts and so on. Uh, so I have a chapter on Trump as a as a the unexpected election of Trump as a big having a big impact on the field of on the culture wars and the, the field of anti woke activism. Then I do a chapter on COVID, how COVID was framed, and COVID split up the movement into two two main groups. On the one hand, the conspiracists, those anti woke activists who felt there was a global conspiracy behind vaccines and lockdowns and so on. There was a tyranny, uh, a tyrannical intent behind COVID. And then there were those who became quite boring and normy and said, no, no, we've got to follow the science. Uh, uh, and they became quite unusual characters because they were supposed to be quite rebellious and anti-establishment. Anti and here they were supporting vaccination. It created a, a cognitive dissonance. So that's that chapter on framing COVID is all about the beginning of the schism within the anti-woke movement. Then there's a chapter on uh, the events following the death of George Floyd. Uh, personas, what kind of personas do these uh, anti-woke figures, how do they negotiate navigating the hybrid media system? And Ukraine was quite a deja vu because um, the same frames that were used uh, for COVID were now being used, uh, and the same two camps. So those who um, 
who were anti-vax became pro-Putin, although they wouldn't put it that way. They, they didn't say, I'm, I'm with Putin, but they would say, I, I, they would question NATO's intents, they, they were, would question US imperialism and the global conspiracy. So the same conspiracists versus boring consensualists, same split that divided up the, the, the field well, during COVID, they recycled the existing frames and again, these are hybrid media frames. They're not merely alternative media frames. They are always engaging with the legacy media, the New York Times, the BBC, and so on. And I end up with uh, this chapter on the worlding effects. The, the world-making effects or consequences, if you don't like the word effects, you can always call them consequences. Some people don't like the word. The worlding consequences slash effects of... Um, digital practices like podcasting, uh, tweeting, and so on. How is it possible to study all these? How on earth can anyone study all these different practices? Uh, I don't know. I'm still <laughs> trying to figure it out. But uh, I do try and think about the net, the net effect of, of these various episodes. Uh, the effect of clashing on Twitter over vaccines or over lockdowns. What, what are the social consequences? So that's, I guess it's very Manchester School. Uh, all the work I do, I always end up with the Manchester School of Anthropology, Victor Turner, Epstein, not that Epstein, the other Epstein. Uh, and so on. I always end up with the, the this processual ethnography, processual anthropology, uh, like a broken record, I keep coming back to the same approach. So that's a hybrid media system. I, when I was chatting to Dave Morley earlier, we, we were talking about transport versus media communication. And uh, my own attempt at, uh, that which no one has read, uh, to respond to Chadwick is to talk about the hybrid communication system, because it's not just media, it's also transport. Uh, and it's not just the the new media is also the old media so there's a double hybridity when it comes to how we communicate um if you had read the article you would know but <laughs> no one ever read it so elon musk uh recently tweeted that x formerly known as twitter is open source news that is the right way to think about it now you may want you may agree or disagree with that the reason I like, I don't normally like what Elon puts out there, but what caught my attention is that the type of public anthropology or online ethnography that I'm practicing for quite a few years now, very much based on this open source idea that you you don't go out there and do your own interviews. You, you look at the, how your own research subjects participants, how they interview one another. So a podcast, looking at a podcast or a YouTube channel is incredible. I much prefer that. <laughs> I mean, I could always try and interview some of these people, but I don't think I need to. I really don't think I need to interview Joe Rogan. There are thousands of hours with the most famous podcaster in the world. I prefer those interviews, but there's a terrible confession for an anthropologist to make. We're not supposed to say that, but I prefer, prefer when they interview each other and I just, it saves you time and you get to know them better as opposed to you stumbling in there and oh, Joe, uh, tell me you're from Texas, are you? No. Uh, so I prefer that. And then for all the nerds, you, have, you can learn so much from all the nerds, all the, all the experts who know everything Jordan Peterson ever said or who hate J.K. Rowling and have collected all these receipts. All these nerds uh, are incredibly valuable. Uh, and they know a lot more than I do about their particular hero. My job is just to try and see the big picture, try and understand what the hell is going on. So it's not open source research in the way that Bellingcat mean. Uh, Bellingcat, as most of you will know, do this. Um, they triangulate, they, they ask citizens to try and work out through photography and video footage and so on for example 
flew down that Malaysian Airlines uh, aircraft some years ago. Uh, so it's, it's detective work. I think the difference is that, at least the way I do ethnography, is that I, I'm not really a detective. I'm not really to, um, trying to do a whodunit. There's no whodunit because you don't even know what you're looking at. You're just following people, work, trying to understand who these people are. So that's different in the sense that we don't try and answer a question, who downed that aircraft? But the similarity is that you also rely on empirical evidence that will help you understand who did what when, the old classic idea of who did, what, the, uh, who did what when and with what consequences. In my case, the world in consequences, how this anti-work world came into being within a few years, within five or six years. So it's open source ethnography of, of a certain kind. There's a lot of non-participant observation and lurking. This is what I was just saying, these emic interviews. I find these encounters incredibly valuable. I must confess, I don't always listen to the entire, if it goes on for seven hours, I must confess, I don't always. I don't think you need to feel that you have to listen to everything. What's really helpful here is the comments that it's not so much what I think went on there is what the fans, the enemies said about this. So you collect lots of tweets, especially the funny ones. I, I love the funny ones. You collect lots of, there's a lot of humor. And this, is a, this is a kind of comedy, comedy ethnography. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of this stuff is really funny. I have some colleagues. Uh, one of them is actually at Oxford, but he lives in Japan, um, Chris Kavanagh who's a cognitive anthropologist. I think he knows you, David. Chris Kavanagh, mm -hmm. uh, who's a postdoc or post-postdoc. And with his Aussie colleague, they set up this podcast called Decoding the Gurus. Is anyone familiar with Decoding the Gurus? It's, it's fantastic. They, they literally take this kind of content and they tear it apart. They are a little bit brutal, in my opinion. I'm, I'm not like that. I'm a much, much kinder person. But they do a really good job at, at critiquing, analyzing the, the, the rhetorical strategies. Um, they do a lot of work on bullshit as well, um, uh, but they don't mean it in a rude way. They just say, you know, scientifically speaking, this is bullshit. Uh, so decoding the gurus is very, there we are, decoding the gurus. That's the, that's Chris Kavanagh, Matt Brown, and they were decoded by another podcaster. As you can see, it's a very, as you know, it's an incredibly rich environment to sit at home and let them do all the hard work and, <laughs> and you just there as a lurker. But it is hard work. I mean, lurking obviously is hard work too. That's an example of, of some material that you collect. You collect tweets and then you collect the thread. Not so much about this, it's about the thread, what, what participants in that world, what they have to say about Jordan Peterson saying up yours to the Canadian Prime Minister. And Brett Weinstein and his partner Heather Hying, they went on TV. So you sometimes are watching a TV a clip uh, that Brett Weinstein went, well, Brett Weinstein went from being an, an anti-woke to an anti-vaxxer. He, uh, he became, well, he could, thinks of himself as a vac vaccine skeptic. He doesn't say he's an anti-vaxxer, but he has serious questions about vaccines. And Tucker Carlson, the guy on the left there, had him on his show a number of times. And sometimes he collects the uh, old uh, legacy media stuff. And that's what happens, really. This really sums up. I could have done the whole show about this slide. This is really, uh, you look horrified. <laughs> it's been a lot. Uh, it ends up being a lot. I think you're right. It's too much. Mm -hmm. So uh, you end up collecting stuff and you try and give it file names, you know, 20, uh, 20, 20 to one Guardian, the Joe Rogan versus Neil Young. And then you can. So that's what happens. I, I collect stuff. Usually I give it a, the year and, and uh, the month. And then I hope, hopefully, I'll remember vaguely what's in there. But then you do have to do the hard work of going back and then you take notes. 
like going to a lecture you, you don't write down everything i don't do any coding i don't bother with coding any of that i just take notes and then i do these mind maps pen and paper big sort of rt sheets uh, where you do first from memory you see how much you remember and then you check and you add bits to the mind map from the stuff you've collected yeah so this this obsessive collecting going on it's probably not healthy i'm not suggesting this is good for you <laughs> uh, but that's how it worked out and you collect open letters you collect all sorts of things you do archival research as i said earlier this is a youtube video from 2018 for me to understand what happened at evergreen college when brett weinstein confronted the anti-racist students i had to go to the footage uh, although i must confess again i chose this case study partly because a lot of other people had looked at it i much prefer case studies that other people have looked at as opposed to me having to have the exclusive uh, i prefer it when 10 or 12 different perspectives have been documented on the case study and then i I combine, I try and make sense of them. But you do some, you do work sometimes with raw footage or with primary stuff, and it's always going to be diachronic. I'm a big fan of the idea of diachronic ethnography. You can't simply do synchronic. You can't simply do a moment in time. You always have to have at least five, six years of the phenomenon you're looking at. You have to, you have to get better at dating, uh, online dating. Not, not that sort of dating, the, the carefully dating when something happened. This was, um, this is actually, it's not really 2018. This was happening in 2017, the early days of the Trump presidency. So the moment is very important. Uh, there was a lot of anxiety for, for very good reasons across the US about the US presidency. So in conclusion, Digital ethnography is an ill-defined, fuzzy buzzword that no one can really properly define. But I see it as a, as a versatile approach to collecting stuff. And that collecting can be online, offline, or both. It can be hybrid. Uh, you don't privilege any prior method. You do whatever works. And very importantly, you may have to fight with your PhD supervisors, your colleagues, your parents, if they think you don't know what you're doing, if you can't really, I know that politically, institutionally, it can be quite difficult to say, I, I'll see, I'll see when I get there, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out when I get there. Uh, it's difficult to say that. On the other hand, the word, the term digital ethnography is quite handy because most people by now, a lot of people by now know that it is an open-ended approach and they can't, you can't really predict exactly what you'll be doing when. Thanks for listening. I really look forward to your questions and comments. Thanks so much. Um, Bill, can you have a look online yeah, just sure. to see if, uh, for online questions? Um, we have to be out of here promptly at five, so I won't monopolize things i'll just say one thing and there's all sorts of things i could jump in on i'll just give you another term for um not asking questions not interviewing people um para ethnography which go um is from marcus and holmes and they interviewed bankers and they said bankers in effect understood themselves and did the ethnography for them all they are doing is repackaging their own eth quasi-ethnographic understanding and i think so just another term questions comments stunned silences somebody at the back yeah, questions i think for the great talk it's about the last point that you have on your conclusion mm -hmm. what advice would you give to someone like a phd researcher on how to contend with kind of like institutional ethics review processes when you're trying to say that you want to take this open ended approach how do you make an argument for it it's very difficult i have constant battles now that no one's listening no <laughs> constructive discussions with <laughs> ethics boards uh some ethics committees don't really understand ethnography very well and they even if they understand it they want to control the, they want to know that they try to control the process that you are controlling 
it's every step of the way. Um, it's a very difficult one. You, you try to be honest, but you have to be diplomatic. You have to be clever at not saying things like, I don't really know what will happen. I, I, can, I can't really anticipate who I'll end up working with. Uh, what I normally do is that I talk to colleagues who are very good at these processes. Um, we have a serious problem, I think, with ethics committees generally, internationally. They've become, I think, more bureaucratic and more risk averse. Uh, in some cases, zero risk uh, tolerance. They don't want any risks at all. Um, can you give me an example? Or is it too political to give me an example? Um, well, I, can, I don't know. My, I think my context is a little bit different. I was doing an ethnography in a corporate setting. Mm -hmm. And with them to and if I had to be very specific in terms of what I was going to do, who I was going to speak with, what I was going to focus on. Yeah. Uh, part of the reason I've done um, online, one of the appeals of doing online open source ethnography is that you don't have to deal with the issue of entering those spaces. If it's stuff that was... Uh, deliberately put out there publicly if it's public figures who want to promote their content that has less much less ethical issues and say the sort of work that Gabriella Coleman did when she did anonymous she studied anonymous the uh, organizing the sort of network of hackers and so on from the inside and that yeah so it will depend on the setting and I think we really need to get better at explaining to ethics committees that Ethnography has been around for over a hundred years, and that there will be risks. There are always risks to anything that you do. But if you take away the open endages, then it's not, it's not, you, you're not really, it's not viable. We need to find, we need to find more allies within the ethics um, committees. And internationally, I'm not sure we've done enough to to do that to promote an ethnographic approach that will help you. Um, I won't name the institution, but there is one institution where they they ask you to respond to all these questions, but they're not giving you any proper guidelines. That's part of the problem that we're not really given uh, in many contexts. You're not really told, OK, this is what is what we would expect to be um, acceptable or recent. What you could do is stress what you can do is stress. Um... In, t in context of consent, you can stress that it is processual, that it's not a one-off, and so it will continually be renegotiated. And the other wonderful word is negotiating and collaborative. And that's so that nothing you're going to do is being imposed on the people you're working with and so what's the problem you know where's the what's the problem that the curate board have yeah um yeah, that's but, very good advice yeah yeah at the back have you had to navigate challenges with like any pushback regarding not deploying big data methods because i do research in like um migration tiktok mm -hmm. um and looking and a lot of my work has been manual and I feel like pressure to like engage with those big data methods. But I also think that they you lose a lot of nuance in the context of the work that I'm doing. So I'm just curious how you navigate that. Yeah, I luckily I haven't had a lot of problem with that, but there are expectations that, yes, uh, it depends on the audience. Institutionally, I haven't had that problem. And because this is self-funded anyway, that, that made things easier. Um, now, it goes back to the comment I made about ethics, that we have to continue to argue our case. We have to demonstrate by referring to the existing, it's very important to refer to the work that's been done. Say, look, this was already, this work was done on an online, this online study was done, they used ethnographic methods, it was published, uh, it, it showed A, B, and C. So the more you can demonstrate with good empirical examples that the this approach works and that not everyone needs to do big data. For example, you could say, well, we need a diversity of approaches. 
not everything has to be either mixed methodology or, or quantitative. And Lisa Pierce, Pierce or Pierce? Lisa Pierce, the qualitative study of anomalous cases. So it's basically look at the outliers. So you can use big data to identify what the outliers are and then qualitative research on the outliers. I can give you the reference. Um, I try to stay away from all that. I try not to, I'm tempted to do, I'm tempted to collaborate with colleagues who work with big data. But then I look at all the stuff, as you saw earlier, all the stuff I've collected and I say, well, do I need any more quantity? So that when we say qualitative, we forget that we end up with piles of stuff. The only difference is that we don't use numbers, but we do in some in some respects because we do use small numbers. We say, well, I've got three or four case studies as opposed to one. One case study, yeah, it's fine, but if you have three or four. So we work a lot with those small numbers. <laughs> have we got anybody online? Uh, <clears throat> I haven't seen any yet. Okay, there's someone. Oh, right. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you mentioned multiple times that you research people, so you choose some people. How do you choose them? Because there are so many people that fall into those categories when you do online research. How did you select who you were focusing on? Very good question. I don't really know if I'm being perfectly frank. I, with this particular project, I had complete freedom, which has its problems, because then what do you, this, who do you focus on? I suppose at some point I, that I intellectual dark web article by Barry Wise in the New York Times, that was very helpful to me and a lot of other people. So now we could place certain individuals and say, okay, so if these are supposed to be the core group, the core anti-wokes uh, and a few others, Jordan Peterson, a few others. I think I'll concentrate on these. So you find, suppose what I've always done in my research, whether online or offline, you find clusters, you find stuff that's going on with a certain group uh, of people. And they say, oh, there's, you know, th there is a concentration of activity going on there. And then within that, you say, you start looking at different yeah, individuals or persons, as we prefer to call them, and uh, you uh, you then follow them on Twitter or wherever they are, newsletters, uh, and if it's offline, you try and go to, it's all about regularity, try and going back again and again to the same people. You've basically described social network analysis without using the phrase. Oh, no. That's what I I'd mean. say. That's what I feared. Uh, <laughs> so, but the difference is that I don't do any analysis. Uh, I don't sit down and analyze anything. I just write up stuff. So there's a deadline. Writing is up. analysis. Yeah. it's. But what I mean is that it's not, I don't do any Formal analysis. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I know. There's no formal analysis. All you do is that you work with what you've got is a little bit messy. And somebody else wouldn't be able to, if I showed my early, it's just like when you're writing an early draft or something, it, it doesn't seem to make much sense. But I think I do avoid, I try to avoid the formals. I prefer the informal economy of um, doing this sort of stuff. But then to what extent do you have to be transparent about your reasoning into choosing those people? Because if you're not writing up and publishing the network analysis that you didn't do, yeah. um, how do you justify to the reader or your... That's a good point. In this case, the way I justified it was to say, to identify four key events in the life course of this particular social space the so-called anti-woke uh, public figures so by choosing those four events that solved the problem for me because then the first one the evergreen state college it had to be brett weinstein it had to be heather hying it had to be tucker carlson i didn't choose them the event chose them for me so one way to do this through the event the more uh and i always somehow end up studying events dramas conflicts i'm not sure why Again, this is all incredibly idiosyncratic. I'm not trying to present this as a prescriptive thing, the, the right way of doing it. It's just what 
I've ended yeah, it's up. It's Max Gluckman, like you're saying. I mean, the one, the, the one Manchester School person you haven't mentioned is Max Gluckman. I forgot put in a plug for him. I 1943, the opening of a bridge in the bridge. I should have mentioned Gluckman. Yeah, Gluckman and, and Turner and so on. I spend a lot of my time in these seminars saying how important the old stuff is for the study mm. of the new. Oh, the shock of the yeah, the shock of the old. If you don't know that book. Um, by e. David some Edgerton, thank you. Yeah. Um, somebody else had raised their hand. Oh, we got two. Yes, you. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to study about attitude in of education so suicide in social media. Mm -hmm. But then, uh, from our discussion before, it seems that I need to do some. It on not need. I mean, I can do a formal social media analysis to cluster which person that becomes like uh, the important figure mm -hmm. in terms of it, and then I can do the qualitative one. Would mm -hmm. that be correct? I think that if it works for you, I think that's that's fine. I think David might be better uh, mm -hmm. qualified to, to talk to that. But yes, if you're, I always find that in my own research, I always start with some kind of mapping. In my case, it's a very sort of hand-drawn, uh, low-tech mapping. Uh, but yeah, any kind of mapping that you can do without falling, I would say, without becoming making it too rigid, without worrying too much about, have I got this exactly right? Am I nailing this? Because social life is too fluid for that. Uh, social network analysis, in my experience, ends up being off it often becomes a bit too static it's a snapshot as a snapshot is fine but perhaps it's a good idea to do several snapshots of network at different points in time that could be helpful but uh i haven't done any social network analysis formally okay yes uh is there any like time span issues in conducting ethnography on past events that is there any ideal length of time from the event that has already passed to the time when the ethnography must be done? Because I'm doing my PhD in also 2017, Indonesian Islamic cyber activism. Mm. And I was thinking of doing ethnography, but then I cancel my plan and I end up doing the network analysis right. in combination with this course analysis. And I started to regret my decision. Yeah. <laughs> like it's so complicated. But uh, I was just wondering, like, is there any any ideal time of when we should start doing ethnography because of the event might have already passed? It depends on what you mean by ethnography. The way I look at ethnography is just any collection of materials that you write up or, on a given human group. So um, I don't think there's any... The, the question here is the quality and quantity of materials you'll be able to collect within the time you have as a researcher. If you have to say 12 months to do your, your primary research and getting hold of those materials becomes very difficult, then you have to think about, okay, how much time have I got to collect enough um, on so that I know as much as I, I can know about this particular phenomenon. Uh, I suppose the problem is that the word ethnography seems to suggest in real time, something that you do, uh, you know, here and now. Uh, but I see ethnography as being equally about something you do, you could do at a distance, and something you can do about the past. You can do this, to use that term, para-ethnography, but you can do a kind of historical ethnography mm -hmm. as well. You can use this ethnographic spirit of the emic perspective. It's all about their own perspective. Uh, and of course, there's ethno ethno historical work. You could do an ethno history, how the group itself, how group uh, members themselves talk about their own history. That can be part of it as well. And too close to the event, of course, people may not understand themselves what's going on, which later they may come to well maybe change their mind or just under their understanding may shift. So I really yeah I don't think there is. An, an ideal term, but um, just following the, the the seriously historical reference is Carlo Ginsberg yeah. and uh, things like the cheese and the worms. So kind of a historian studying 
a heretic during the um uh, the um, what do you call it the inquisition um and of course you can't talk to anyone because they're all several hundred years dead but it's a very similar spirit yeah. it's this this yeah. as you say the spirit of ethnography but um yeah, yeah. okay one more and we'll um, yeah I we'll, think we'll have to make this last oh yeah uh, I'm a data scientist and I had a question like what kinds of like big data projects do you think would be interesting to uh, do with like the intellectual dark web or other online subcultures? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, I don't know enough about big data, but yes, I wish. Actually, this came up in, in Cologne at Cologne University a couple of months ago. Um, I think somebody asked me, so are you against big data? Uh, we're combining big data. I think an ethnographic approach is one of the advantages of ethnography is that it's compatible with any other approach. Ethnographers, uh, they ex we accept everything. If someone, if someone is a big data specialist and they want to work with an ethnographer, I think that's incredibly uh, compatible. But I don't really know. I haven't looked at big data other than in passing. I, I don't really know it enough about big data. And I'd say identify the outliers for me to go and look at in, in data as a way. Because um, the outliers illuminate the norm. It's exactly turning the usual instincts of a data scientist on their head. That you can learn more. There are more ways of being normal than there are of being abnormal. There's it's also example, turning Tolstoy on his head. There's an example <laughs> of that of outliers in an activist in America called Chris Rufo, who's very close to Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. And he's got into trouble with the other so called anti works because he's too much of an activist and he wants to do things, change things. So he's an outlier in the sense mm. that all the others, the the mainstream anti-works, they say, well, you know, we have to have these conversations. They, uh, they said that there's all divide between talking and acting. Uh, and that's so you, you can study that person and it helps you understand the, the more central characters. Okay, I think we must wrap up here. So can we thank uh, John again?